Well, I guess it's nine o'clock with my clock. Yep. So get started here. Um, got a long ways to go and a short time to get there as the song goes. Um, chapter five, Unity, the God of Islam from Karen Armstrong's book, A History of God. I'm gonna start off with a little bit of, uh, here's my outline. I'm, I'm doing it a little bit differently than the book is, more on subjects kind of than she weaves it all together, but we'll do some, uh, goes through some Arabic terms, uh, talk about the context, of the rise of Islam and Muhammad and you know, coming forth of the Quran, and the early history of Islam, five pillars of Sunni Islam, and then some Islamic beliefs. And we don't get into much depth into those, but we'll try to hit some high points. So um, Allah, Allah was the, the God of the Arabian people before Muhammad, but he was the high God um, on the uh, ancient Arabian pantheon. It, Allah just means the God, and they considered him to be identical to the God of the Jews and the, and the Christians. Of course, Islam is just becoming a uh, convert to God. You surrender your uh, will to God, and that's a Muslim, a person who has surrendered their whole being to God. Um, I think this Murawa was an ideology that existed at the time uh, before Muhammad uh, came on the scene that required Arabs to obey their hajib, their uh, sahib, or the chief, um, regardless of personal safety. So it was kind of egalitarian, um, provided a rough and ready form of justice. Um, then there was the Umad, the United Community of nearly all the tribes of Arabia. And then we've got the Hajj, the Ma which uh, Muhammad instituted the an annual pilgrimage to Mecca. The Quraysh, this was the mercantile confederation that controlled the city of Mecca. Shirk was a term that we'll hear, which is just basically idolatry. Of course, you've heard of, I'm sure, of the Hijra the, or Hijra migration of Muslims to Medina. Uh, hadith is, or Hadith, I'm not sure which, is the collected words and sayings of Muhammad. And a Sunnah is um, practices of Muhammad. The Mutazilis, that was a sect of Islam that applied rationality to uh, uh, studying God and discussing God and then you got the Quran, which is the official compilation of Muhammad's revelations. Okay, next, uh, context of the uh, rise of Islam. The Quraysh uh, community was very, in Mecca was very successful towards the end of the sixth century. Their lifestyle had greatly improved over the previous generations who had struggled to survive. Uh, but with their success came uh, ruthless capitalism, which um, placed their tribal values in jeopardy and superseded them. And those values uh, were that the tribe came first, individuals were second, because everyone depended on each other for survival. This was part of the uh, Murawa ideology. This uh, new success, new wealth of the Quraysh gave them a feeling that they were self-sufficient, the kind of like the rugged individualist uh, individualism in the U.S. and the out west. Um, so that was replacing all this communal cooperation and leading to competition. And Muhammad, he looked at this and he thought that this was going to lead to the disintegration of the tribe. Another part of the ideology of Mural was the vendetta or blood feud. And so the tribes were fighting among themselves all the time and preventing them from becoming united, a united people. And then the Jews and the Christians, whom the uh, Arabs trade with, they uh, 
Um, they taunted the Arabs that they were a barbarous people and never had received a revelation, which gave, a, I guess, an inferiority complex to the Arabs. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, they were having this cultural transition or uh, whatever um, due to their financial success. And younger people were getting disillusioned with all this capitalism of the uh, Quraysh. And then there were underprivileged and uh, marginalized groups, women, slaves, and some of the weaker clans. These were all attracted to Muhammad's message. And he had a message of, of a just society that was equitable and everyone was treated uh, fairly and decently. So I kind of wonder, is there a lesson here to be applied today in the, in the US particularly, and then wherever the economic inequality gap is expanding um, as far as, I guess, as far as religion goes or society in general, what do you think? Well, I think that's something that drew a lot of people to our particular religion was the concept of Zion where everybody would be, you know, sort of equals and uh, shared and communal type thing in the original uh, starting out of our church. I kind of thought the same thing, Arlene. That was, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it seemed like we had early success, uh, particularly over in England. And I think our concept of Zion and um, that was particularly appealing to marginalized people. So um, maybe we can uh, work on that. That seems like to me that's that's one of the lessons I, I got from it. Does anybody else have some other idea uh, about this? Well, I do think that's what Jesus taught too. You know, I mean, a lot of his ideas could be socialist ideas if you looked at it in that context. I mean, I think it's that whole egalitarian, everybody is welcome. And the, the famous parable that the rich man can't get into heaven, I think is very similar to this. Okay. Okay, I went backwards, let's see. Okay, so um, let's move on to, um, so we kind of set a little bit of the context of why, of what led to the rise of Islam and the acceptance of Islam in the early 600s. We're talking a little bit now about um, uh, Muhammad, born around 570, I'm not sure they know exactly, but born 570, died 632, he was orphaned at a young age and then raised by his uncle, um, worked as a merchant and as a shepherd. Um, he married when he was 25 to a, an older widow woman uh, who was wealthy. That was, and I think she actually proposed to him, I believe. But anyway, he developed this habit of retreating to a cave that was in the mountains near Mecca to pray. And when he was 40, while he was asleep in the cave, he was forcefully awakened by this, the angel Gabriel, who commanded him to recite. And Muhammad said, I'm not a reciter. <laughs> um, does that remind you of any other prophets we've been talking about in the last year? Moses. Moses, why does it remind you of Moses? Well, because uh, when God came to Moses and told him that he was going to have to go tell the Egyptians to let the Israelites go, he said, I'm, I'm, uh, I have weak language or I, my, I'm not a strong speaker. And God said he would give him somebody to speak for him. Okay. Anybody else? Hint. Cave. I'm trying to remember some of the old. Well, my testament. first thought was Elijah. Now he Elijah, yeah. Just because he was he was in a cave and had this 
powerful experience. Um, so that was uh, my my thought. But Moses probably is 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 better than Elijah. I mean, the cave is is kind of incidental, and uh, God speaking and Moses' reply is kind of similar to what um, uh, Muhammad had. So I think you know all the great prophets spent time out in the in the wilderness away from people for Moses. It was the mountain for Elijah. It was the cave for Joseph Smith. It was the grove. Um, every, everybody had, um, sort of a nature environment where they encountered God. Okay. Good point. Um, some versions of the, um, story about Muhammad say he was commanded to read and the, the word Ikra and every word is it's hard to translate i guess because it could be recite repeat or read but i kind of thought why would you why would people think read because he was illiterate <laughs> it, that didn't quite jive with me but anyway that's just a my my thought on that um anyway muhammad was he was embraced by this angel until he thought he was going to be crushed. He had all his breath squeezed out. And, and this happened a total of three times. And each time the angel was, was telling him to recite and he said he couldn't. Um, made me kind of think of a little bit, just the, the physical struggle with this angel of Israel wrestling with the angel. Jacob, who became Israel, that is. Um, that was just, uh, reminded me of that after the third time though, um, words started to pour forth from his mouth and this became his first revelation, which was later compiled into the Quran and, and, uh, was the start of that. His experience also seems familiar with Joseph Smith in a couple of ways, but how do you see that? Do you think it is, or you think it's not really that similar? Well, Joseph translated, supposedly, instead of <clears throat> just pouring out of his mouth, but other than that. I was thinking of his first encounter when he was awakened in the night and um, the angel came to him three times with the message of what he was of kind of what was uh, he was going to be involved with. So as this kind of as this sequence of three was the parallel I saw. You're right that um, he didn't actually wasn't told to recite. He was just told what was going to transpire. Um, does anyone know who the uh, who else the angel Gabriel appeared to besides, uh, of course, he, uh, besides the Arab Muhammad in the Bible? There are there are three humans that are mentioned. I think uh, Mary and Joseph, wasn't it? Independently, it was two of them. Um, well, Mary, I'm not, I don't know if we, I don't remember it being Joseph, but. Mary was one. There was somebody else in the New Testament also. Zechariah? Yes. And then there's one person in the Old Testament. And that's Daniel. Oh, okay. So the angel Gabriel has been around with some other people. Um, this was a, well, it was a terrifying experience for, for Muhammad. He rushed from the cave. He thought he was, he thought he was going to throw himself off the mountain. But then I heard a voice saying, oh, oh, Muhammad, thou art the apostle of God, and I am Gabriel. And Armstrong, Armstrong says that Gabriel is often identified as the Holy Spirit of Revelation. He, was a, he thought he might be possessed by the spirit who haunted people and led them into error. Um, but eventually, and he 
told his wife about what, what had happened and she had a friend and he convinced him uh, that this was a revelation from God that he was really uh, God's messenger to the Arabs. So that uh, calmed him down some. Here is the, the cave that um, Muslims uh, go to. It's uh, Gar Hira, it's uh, on the mountain, on Mount Hira. Um, but this is the little, it's a really small cave from what I, what I read, but here's the, a picture of it. I even have, looks like, you can't see it. In one picture I saw there was some graffiti, so even Arabs have problems with graffiti, but <laughs> <laughs> they've got some, I don't know what this says, but um, people go there and visit it. Uh, <clears throat> historic site? Yes, yeah, one of their first historic sites. Um, over a period of 23 years, he received uh, a total of 114 revelations, and it came bit by bit, line by line, verse by verse. It, was, it wasn't just all poured out on him in one, one short section. It, it took a while. Um, and the way I gather it happened was, since he couldn't read or write, he recited the words and learned the words by heart and somebody else wrote them down. He was literate. Uh, what interested me was that Armstrong says this receiving this message was a really difficult process. And um, it almost sounded like a physical process from what I read also that sometimes he would have uh, physical symptoms of, I don't like a, I don't know if he had a cold sweat or what, but, um, he had to listen very carefully and sometimes the message wasn't clear and I thought this was very instead he learned that he must not force words or particular con conceptual meaning until the true meaning revealed itself and this reminded me of something that Oliver Cowdery was told um, does anybody else remember what that was well it also reminds me of so something that some of our latter day um presidents and have uh, president prophets have commented on that you know it took a long time for him to come up with um, the wording and such that it was revealed to him over time okay um, anyone in particular Arlene just the last couple of them okay well this is the this is what uh <clears throat> and I won't read the whole thing, but this is what uh, Revelation through Joseph Smith to Oliver Cowdery, when he was thought he could translate the Book of Mormon. And, and I guess the key part was you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause your bosom to burn within you. And then, um, so there was this thing, it's not just automatically granted to you, if you just by asking. And I thought, to me, that was a parallel. It seemed similar to what Muhammad was reporting was it, it didn't, it wasn't just like he's a, a funnel and God pours the words right through him and it just comes out of his mouth or, and there's some involvement. So uh, that was my, what struck me about his experience and how it was similar to Oliver Cowdery's. Hey, Dennis? Uh -huh. I'm also kind of struck about how long it took Muhammad to um, to write the Quran, and it does remind me of the early Joseph Smith years with the um, with not necessarily the Book of Mormon, but the Doctrine and Covenants, and how those how those um, prophecies kind of slowly came out as the church was forming. You know, and he kind of had uh -huh. to answer some questions like Muhammad did that people had. Yeah. yeah, of course, you compare the Book of Mormon to this, that was kind of like a one giant gush compared to Muhammad, 23 years to come up the Quran and yeah, in a much shorter time frame for the Book of Mormon. But anyway, um, yeah, and even the Doctrine and Covenants, that, that early stuff probably came out pretty fast, but the earliest ones, yes. Um, now, the, the way the Quran is organized is not in chronological order, but 
Armstrong says that really doesn't matter because the way it's it's arranged, the longest revelations first and the shortest ones last. But the Quran is more of a reflection on different themes, um, talking about God, uh, the prophets, the last judgment, and uh, so it's it's really there isn't a, a narrative per se that goes through it that, where a chronology would be helpful. It it's, it sounds. It sounds topical, yes. Um, another thing that was pointed out was Arabic is very difficult language to translate. And um, Muslims say that the beauty of the Arabic language is lost when you translate it. And Armstrong related a few stories of people who, in the early days of Islam, who hurt when they read or heard the Quran. Uh, recited that they, they were kind of like converted on the spot because of the beauty of the language, which I, I found interesting. Of course, I can't translate or read Arabic, so I can't speak to that, but it's uh, just the language. They just had, it was just kind of overpowering that some, it could be written so beautifully. And, and when you read it in English, evidently you lose a lot of the flavor. <laughs> Dennis, um, so yeah. that's yeah, kind of um, who's that? Somebody's. I'm just going to say, you know, it reminds me a little bit of some of our hymn singing because uh, there are hymns that we sing that literally move people, myself included, to tears. And there's you would speak the words, and it doesn't have the impact. Um, I think, in some sense, we have a kind of a parallel to that in some of the hymns that we sing. Okay. Well, music has this kind of a special um, effect on people, I think. Let's see, I'm gonna get here to... Just to briefly go through the, a little bit of a timeline so in 610, he's 40 years old, receives his first revelation. Um, about 614, uh, for a few years, uh, like the first three years or so, he just spoke privately to his friends and family about what was happening to him in these revelations. But by, I think his fourth year, he was starting to speak, preach publicly about, um, these concepts and revelations. And he, in 614, I'm kind of guessing here, but I think it must have been when he first started speaking publicly, he for, forbid the Muslims to worship pagan gods. And this turned a lot of people off. And they, uh, the Muslims became uh, a persecuted minority, even accused of uh, atheism, which the Christians were accused of that early on too uh, by those who were believed in multiple gods. Life among the Quraysh became impossible. <clears throat> A few years later, <clears throat> Muhammad um, tried to, he was really in, interested in the ancient religion of Judaism. And so he tried to bring his religion closer and he instituted a few requirements and things to bring it closer to Judaism, such as praying to Jerusalem, which we know now that they pray to uh, uh, Mecca, but in. Pray towards, not to. Okay, prayed towards, my wife corrected me. Uh, prayed towards, uh, you know, facing uh, Jerusalem and then. Um, fasting and some dietary laws. And at first the Jews were accepting of him, but they later turned against him. Um, what do you think they did that? I think before he moved to Medina, they were kind of making fun of him because he tried to understand them, but he, he couldn't read. So he didn't know what the Torah said. So he got a lot wrong. 
is what I remember reading. Well, that, that was one thing. Um, there was also, so there was a religious element of things. Um, he didn't, he didn't always get things right. And, but he also learned quite a bit from, the, uh, there were friendly Jews that uh, showed him uh, the Torah and ex he learned some about his own past, about Ishmael and, um, that's true. So there were things that that he did learn, but they also, like you said, they taunted him with uh, his ignorance, kind of. There was also a political aspect where the Jews were doing pretty well in uh, the present setup, and they sort of started thinking they were going to lose power. Um, that was in, so politics entered in, or power, whichever you want to think of it. Um, Armstrong said this was probably his greatest disappointment um, you have any thoughts about why this would have been a, a, his greatest disappointment? Everybody wants to belong. Yeah. Be revered. Okay, that's good. Sharon, did you have something you were going to say? I just said he went back to his roots and they didn't really appreciate him. Okay. In 622, uh, some of the Muslims, oops. I would just add, Dennis, um, um, one more off. thing. If I could, can I add one more thing about what we were just talking about? Sure. I think all of the great prophets had um, a wider vision about who their message was for. Um, yes, the prophets of the Jews, the message was for the Jews, but the ultimate goal was to have a temple that would bring ministry to the rest of the world. You know, with the image uh, from uh, Ezekiel of the river flowing from the temple to the rest of the Gentiles. And, you know, Jesus and, and then Christianity, that certainly... Uh, was the message and actually what, what happened as the gospel was taken to the rest of the Roman Empire. And I think Muhammad may have had some of that same feeling that he really wanted what he was experiencing to be shared by the wider religious community of the day. Um, and I wonder if that bothered him. I, I wonder if he felt rejected because of the Jews not totally uh, buying in with his message. Well, I know Armstrong says in her book that because, because he was rejected uh, by the Jews, that there is, in the Quran, there are some polemics against the Jews after that, which kind of reveal somewhat of his um, disappointment of being rejected. And, and so there's some polemics, polemics against the Jews later in the in the um, Quran that he, revelations he brought forth. Um, because they were facing persecution in uh, Mecca, they were um, invited by some pagan Arabs up north in Yathrib or also known as Medina. And they, head off, they headed up to uh, Medina um, <clears throat> where they lived for a little while, but, um, the Quraysh were still against them, and they had a, a key battle. Muslims from Medina defeated the Quraysh in this battle of, of I guess it's Badr. Um, so that was a kind of a key battle that was fought. Um, and then the next year, Muhammad commanded the um, because of this rejection of the Jews, uh, Muhammad commanded the Muslims to pray facing towards uh, Mecca instead of Jerusalem. Armstrong again says this is one of his most uh, creative religious gestures. Uh, and she gives her reason. Why, why do you think she would say that? What do you think was the symbolism of praying to 
Mecca instead of Jerusalem, what did what did that convey to uh, Muslims? Well, I think it conveys a uniqueness of their identity as a religious group because the Jews and the Christians both feel that Jerusalem is a special place. Okay. Now, now, now Islam had its own special place. Do you think it might have established their independence as their own religion, maybe? Yeah, exactly. That was my thought. In 628, uh, they had a they signed a treaty, the Muslims signed a treaty with the Quraysh. Uh, at least from this treaty, the Quraysh did recognize Muhammad as being their equal and that well, Islam was a rising power. So there was some recognition on, on the part of these other Arabs that this was uh, this group of people, they weren't going away. So they established that with this treaty. Um, there were some more battles and <clears throat> by 630, uh, Islam's conquest of the Arabian Peninsula was essentially complete. Uh, and in 630 also, Muhammad cleared the Kaaba of idols and images and rededicated it to the worship of God. Uh, 632, Muhammad died after a very short illness. And then, no surprise, after he died, Islam split into Sunni and Shia factions. They had a dispute over who the leader should be and what form of how leadership should be transferred uh, to successors, uh, who should be chosen. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like Mormonism. <laughs> so well, it also um, replicates or duplicates the split of Christianity between Eastern Orthodox and the Western Christian Church. Right. Well, yeah. How do you think? Don't you think of that more as a doctrinal split rather than a leadership split, though, Jonathan? Well, they have separate leadership, and in fact, uh, it was, uh, I think it was a split over who was going to be Pope that separated the, the two groups. Okay, I was thinking more, um, the split started developing uh, over the doctrinal issues from the Council of Nausea and and some other councils, and eventually just I didn't see eye to eye on that, but um, but maybe the Orthodox didn't recognize the Pope as being the Pope like the Western the Catholic side did. Um, <clears throat> later, they had they had four um, what they call rightly guided caliphs uh, that ruled for a, a period of time. I know. 40, uh, 50 years or so. But eventually, the Uma, Uma, see if I can say this, Umayyad, they seized control of the caliph and they started to expand the Islamic empire uh, into um, Asia and Africa. And here we see kind of, this map kind of shows the progression of our expansion of Islam uh, with the darkest uh, kind of orange-like being what was established during Muhammad's time. And then the lighter brown uh, was territory added by the four caliphs in the 50 years or so after him. And then this green, light green stuff is what the Umayyad, Umayyad uh, caliphs established over another 80 year period from up to 750. And then this purple is, uh, this map says that's not an Islamic kingdom. So this kind of gives you how, how I expanded over, the, over 
130 years or so. Do you know if the split, uh, if they stayed close to each other or did they go different directions to start? You mean, um, when In you the mean Sunni different directions the between the Sunni and the Shia? Right. Um, I don't know if they're based, I don't think their basic beliefs are that much. It's more about the, I think it's, as I understand, it's mostly about leadership and who gets who gets to be the leader and or leaders and and so it's, it was more of a struggle or disagreement on that point i don't well their discipline's a lot different on they have they different do. practices uh, their basic beliefs i don't think are too much different well what i what my question was <clears throat> did they stay close together in location or after the split, did they one take the east, one take the west sort of thing and kind of develop in different areas and then come back and clash more? Or did they kind of stay side by side and still you know, develop their separateness? Well, I can't really have, uh, I can't tell, answer that uh, Arlene on the, at least for the first few hundred years. By now, we know that, of course, Saudi Arabia is, is Sunni, is, Iran is is Shia, uh, so they have different geographic areas now. Uh, yeah. In the first few hundred years, I don't know if they were kind of mingled together or that. I was just quickly. curious in relation to your map here if we had any information on that. Uh, can't tell you any more, I don't think, so. Okay. So now I'm like to trying to quickly do a little research on that, Dennis, and it said that from a religious or a theological perspective, the Sunnis and the Shias have a lot more in common than they do differences. Right. Um, and there are some countries where the Sunni and the Shia live together side by side in relative state of peace, so they're not fighting like they have been in the Middle East. A lot of times it seems like people are not that different, except when it comes to their, who gets to be the, the boss, <laughs> who gets to be the leader, the politics, the power part uh, separates them, even though they may have similar thinking and beliefs. I wonder if they were like we were, we're not the Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought, um, Armstrong doesn't really go through the five colors of, of Islam, not, and this is Sunni Islam, and there's some, uh, some of these colors are a little different for Shia, but I didn't want to get into both of them or have time really, I didn't think. So um, there's five pillars, and the first one, of course, is profession of faith, of faith. and if you want to become a convert to Islam and become a Muslim, you have to say there is no God. They probably would say no God but Allah. No God but God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Those are the first steps in converting to Islam. And you re you're supposed to say this uh, during prayer five. Uh, when you pray, they pray five times a day. Uh, so this is part of that. And the second pillar is... Salah or prayer. And before you pray, um, you perform some ablutions in which involve uh, cleanliness. Uh, and well, I'll show you a slide here of what that involves. But so you pray facing Mecca, certain times, certain positions. Th these are very prescribed. And when you change positions, you there's different words you say. You don't have to say them in the, you don't have to be at the mosque. You can say them anywhere. Uh, the mosque is, would be pre the preferred location because of the communal aspect of it. But this is uh, in, in the Eastern, Middle Eastern world, at least this is very common. So there's a guy who calls the people to prayer five times a day. And this is just a picture of somebody doing that. 
then you perform these ablutions. And this is just a picture of a guy. Uh, there's several things you wash and this shows him washing his ears. Um, but here's the next one. It shows the, um, the different things you're supposed to wash uh, in preparation for prayer. So, um, of course, you wash your hands, you wash your, your neck, uh, you, you do, you, it's, I'm not sure you rinse out your mouth, but, um, and then your nose, and then you wash your arms up to your elbows, face, um, you wash your feet up to your ankles, and you do this every time you, well, you do this when you, you pray the first time in the day, and if you maintain a state of purity, you don't have to repeat these for the following prayers, but anything, there's a lot of things that can uh, disrupt this purity, and then you have to repeat this. So if you have to go to the bathroom after that first time, then you're going to have to have perform ablutions. If you, uh, other things that happen, you can, um, you'll have to perform these ablutions again. So these are just kind of symbolic of that. And then you go into prayer and there are these positions and words that you recite in the different positions. And they are kind of particular, uh, uh, for example, how when you're on your prostrating yourself of how you do that, you don't squat back on your heels, uh, different positions that are prescribed and what you're supposed to say. And so uh, this, and then of course they say this, um, particularly in the mosque, they're all together. I think it really creates a sense of we're all doing the same things at the same times. There are set times during the day when you do this. So I thought this was kind of humorous. Somebody starting off young is trying to learn, learn the positions. The third pillar is zakat almsgiving. And um, <clears throat> this is for us would be um, giving our offerings and tithes uh, similarly. They have a, um, usually they spend about two and a half percent of their income. It's not something that's actually stated in the Quran, but one of the Muhammad's uh, hadiths, uh, which is some, a collection of other sayings of his that's not in the Quran. Uh, but this is part of their social justice, economic uh, equality, helping others who are less fortunate. Uh, I think we're familiar with that. Um, it would fit in with our concept of Zion, um, no poor among them, uh, trying to achieve that state. The fourth pillar is fasting psalm. Uh, we're most familiar with this with Ramadan, which is the holy month in uh, their calendar, which takes place from dawn to sunset. And you have to abstain from food, sexual intercourse, smoking, um, during that period, but after that, during, after sunset, then you, you can participate in those activities. And, um, this reminds Muslims that there are others that need to help are less fortunate. I thought it was interesting to point out that fasting is not required for those for whom it would be dangerous or problematic children, pregnant women, those who have health conditions. Uh, pregnant women only they can they can uh, practice fasting if they don't believe it poses any risk to their health, but they're not required to. So they're they're trying to be cognizant of people that are in 
situations where it wouldn't be healthy to do that. I thought that was interesting. Of course, the fifth one, fifth pillar is Hajj or the pilgrimage. Um, going to, make, to Mecca and you wear, try to wear the same type of two sheets of clothing so everybody looks is pretty much equal. There's no class distinction. You walk around the Kaaba seven times. Uh, there's some other things you do. Uh, there's a black stone, which was part of the Kaaba that they're supposed to touch. Um, then you go to these uh, mounts, Saifa and Marwa, and then there's this sy symbolic stoning of the devil. Some of these things were already practiced before Muhammad, uh, but they, he incorporated some of this, some things, and he, I think he clarified how it was to be done more precisely. Um, so the Kaaba was a, in existence before Islam came to be. So um, the, the Hajj is spelled out in the, in the Quran. So there's your five pillars. And then this is with the Muslims at prayer around the Kaaba uh, during uh, Ramadan. Most of the time you see them traveling, circling around in it. I don't see how they keep track of it. Here they they're in concentric circles uh, to pray to the towards Mecca, towards the Kaaba. So that was. Hey Dennis, can can you tell me what that Kaaba is? I mean, it's like a pillar. Well, it's kind of a, it's a building. It's just it's kind of a cube like building. Um, it was built before Muhammad. Now, of course, it's been rebuilt, I think, several times. Uh, during the uh, Ramadan, I don't think anybody can go inside. There'd be such a crowd of people that trying to get inside, they don't allow that. But there's other times that some people are permitted to go inside of it. I don't know that there's anything particularly special inside going inside. I mean, it's very beautiful what I've read, uh, marble lower walls, and there's some kind of a green cloth on the upper level. Um, I think there's only one door that's just in, in the eighties, I think they made it out of solid, made it out of gold. I don't know if it's solid gold or if it's gold plated, but there's, it's gold. Um, but it has a long history uh, in the Arab world uh, even before Muhammad, uh, as being a holy place. In fact, that was one of the things uh, about the Kaaba that the Muslims believe that, um, and we get into this, but Muslims believe that uh, Abraham and his son Ishmael built the Kaaba or rebuilt it. Some people say it was already before Abraham, but he rebuilt it. But most of them, it's attached to, uh, connected to Abraham building the first temple to God, and this is it. In, in Muslim belief. That tradition has that it was a four-sided uh, structure that had no roof to it. Um, built by originally. And Isaac. Yeah, originally. Anything else, Jane, you want to curious about? Thank you. Hey, Dennis, before you go further, you know, as you were going through the five pillars of Islam, you mm -hmm. know, I kept thinking, okay, I wonder how two and a half percent of your income compares with our 10% tithing of um, beyond necessary needs. And, and I also wondered, um, I wonder if we, I wonder if we would do well to do go through some kind of purity exercise before we pray or if we we force ourselves to pray five times a day um and i i wondered if uh you know do we really even fast anymore i mean i just thoughts that crossed my mind as you were talking about the five pillars 
don't have an answer, just questions. Oh, that's okay. I I don't know. I think uh, our level of giving, I wouldn't be surprised what it's probably about comparable to that when you, uh, what people actually give. Um, now, I think the Mormon church, it's a lot higher for them. Um, and they're a little, I think theirs is more of a flat 10% on across the board versus our what we used to have of 10% on the increase, which is now we've I don't know most people keep most people don't do the tithing procedure like they used to and they are encouraging just the disciples in response. Preparation, I this thing of going through all this cleanliness um, I think would be kind of set a tone for when you when you pray wouldn't you think i would i mean we used to uh fast on communion sunday that in a sense that was some preparation right but i think it's just fascinating that uh uh followers of islam wash their hands wash their feet wash their mouth wash their arms i mean it really is a matter of coming before God in a uh, in a cleansed or purified state. You know, one thing that kind of crossed my mind was you'll notice. Um, let's see, I'll go back here. Well, it's also a very formalized way. <clears throat> they're required to, uh, you know, by their culture to do that, and whereas we are told to pray continuously and you know on a lot less formal basis for the most part <clears throat> yeah i was one point i i went back to this picture here you'll notice their feet there's no shoes on them does that make you think of moses and take off your shoes you're on holy ground that does Kind of makes me what I mean. I don't know. That's how they got there with that practice, but that's what makes me think of of establishing a sense of being in a sense of, of presence of God. I see all these things, and and I keep wondering where the women are. Yeah, they're upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own special yeah, room in the book. Yeah. But they're supposed to be equal. I know that Muhammad said women were to be equal. So why are they separated out? They're not. Well, they're not there. And so what Armstrong pretty. had to say about that was that in the early days when Muhammad was alive, that uh, women's status was much better off, I guess I would say, than probably after the first four caliphs. It seemed like some, I'm going to guess, but over time, uh, women's status was diminished greatly. Um, according to one of the things in the book said is that women had uh, rights of inheritance and uh, rights to divorce in the early days of, of Islam, which in the Western world didn't occur until hundreds of years later. But as you point out, they, that changed over time. Uh, I was in a mosque one time um, as part of a, a class I was in, um, and we went. We were we observed it. We weren't really in the in the uh, prayer group, but the women were in a room behind the uh, the men to where they were. Jerry was wanting to tell you something. Yeah. Oh, Jerry. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, I just like to share something uh, that uh, all of this brings to my mind. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, been in Muslim countries, uh, but I've had the privilege of being in Morocco on several occasions and uh, uh, see the movement of people there who are Muslim. 
as they go to the temple or to the their shrine and building for the prayer. And um, uh, the picture that you show on the screen there uh, is a very uh, accurate reminder to me of the impression that that group of people has uh, when you see them going to their temple, going to their place, and kneeling down on their prayer robes and praying. And even in the exercise that they have, that they uh, practice before they actually go there and kneel down for their prayer, uh, the, the men will go to a faucet anywhere outside on a building and wash themselves uh, before they enter. And then they're there for the prayer. And um, we consider that, of course, all very different from the way that we as Westerners and Christians pray or celebrate. But I can't help but uh, remember the impression that it had on me and still has on me to see this periodically, day after day after day, these people coming and to a common place in the hundreds and even as there probably approaches over a thousand people sometimes and they do this on a daily basis uh, we don't think of that as a in any sense as part of our worship exercise that we go through in christianity or at least i don't but you can't help when you think about it being very much impressed by what can happen with a group of people when they come together in common cause to praise their God as they understand it. And uh, uh, this whole lesson that we're doing this morning kind of reminds me or challenges me personally to think through how do we best celebrate the our uh, devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God. And I'm not suggesting that uh, we as a church should duplicate what they uh, what we're what, what we're seeing there and what they do. What I am saying is that there is a hunger on the part of people to meet their God in communication and prayer. And uh, we might well learn some things thinking through what this does in their lives and simply think through about practices that we have and to what extent we may learn something as we think through our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I had. Oh, thanks, just, Garrett. Just think of the feeling that you get when you go to the auditorium during World Conference and when you're united with all the people from around the world and how powerful that feels compared to just going to church on Sunday morning in your smaller groups. It is a power uh, in numbers that you feel. Yeah, I was thinking of the scripture where two or three. I was just going to say what the other thing that's uh, fascinating is some some of my most impressive uh, religious experiences have been going to places that have historic value to the church, the temple, the auditorium, Nauvoo. Uh, and you do have that sense, especially in, in the conference chamber of being part of something larger. Yeah. And uh, that, I go back to my comments earlier about uh, him singing. There's nothing more powerful than being in the conference chamber of the auditorium when they're singing uh, almost any song, and it's just very moving. Okay. Well, if you take the scripture about two or three gathered, uh, and you multiply that into like at at met at the uh, Kaaba where there's um, hundreds of thousands gathered. I mean, this is inside the the mosque itself around the Kaaba, but 
uh, outside the mosque, there's thousands, thousands of more people gathered there. It's a huge gathering. The sense of of um, community and and strength there must be enormous. Well, even on their, you know, when they're not gathered in groups, they're aware that other people are praying at the same time every day, five times a day. So they know that they are connected and that's part of the power that they feel is their connection, knowing that, you know, they have a set time five times a day that they're supposed to be praying. We do a little bit of that, like uh, Thursday evening at seven o'clock before John O'Neill had his surgery, when people were asked to pray. I mean, we, we do a little bit of that by praying at, at the same time, uh, or even praying for a person, a specific person on a specific day. And there's the prayer for peace at, um, each day, yes. one o'clock. And the Wednesday night prayer service. I'll move on now to some Islamic beliefs. Uh, the, the preeminent one, I guess, would be Allah is the one God, the eternal, the uncaused cause of all being beyond human understanding. <clears throat> and kind of as a consequence of that or direct following that, their greatest sin in the eyes of in the Islamic world is idolatry, shirk. Muhammad refused to compromise. This created problems with the other Arabs uh, on this matter of idolatry when he forbade the Muslims to worship any other gods. Uh, so that is their greatest sin. Um, a belief in God is all powerful, all knowing. Um, Armstrong basically was the opinion that uh, Allah is is more of a, a more impersonal God than uh, the biblical Yahweh. That he lacks pathos and the uh, passion of the biblical God uh, Yahweh in the Old Testament. This is where I was going to tell you, uh, referred to Jane was, uh, Muslims believe that Abraham was the first Muslim and with his son Ishmael built the Kaaba, the first temple to God. And the Kaaba was a holy place for Arabs before Muhammad. Now what some believe that, that uh, the, the Kaaba was uh, re rebuilt by Abraham, but I think it's what I could gather. It was seemed like the more common belief was he was the first. He, he was the one that built it first. Uh, some tried to take it back to uh, uh, to Adam. So there's there's not a block uniformity of belief about some of these things, but Abraham has a very prominent place in uh, the role of the Kaaba. Dorothy Does has a comment. Say, Dorothy has a comment, and then I have a comment. Okay. Dorothy, you got to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. Um, just before I forget, uh, regarding the praying five times a day, um, if they're traveling or if they're out of the, their home country, um, at least the students that I had, and I had a bunch of them at Park College, um, they only have to pray three times a day. Hmm. Oh, they get a traveling exemption, huh? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. Okay. And Dennis, I, I thought I read in this chapter, but you correct me if I'm wrong, that Muhammad, before he kind of um, learned more from the Jews, he didn't have in his, his knowledge that um, Abraham's son, Ishmael, that whole story, that kind of came out after he met with the Jews? Correct. Okay. I thought that he was, was not real well. In, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, the, the whole thing of learning, he learned a lot from the friendly Jews uh, at Medina that <clears throat> shared the script, uh, the story in the Old Testament and, you know, the Torah and the other prophets. He, I mean, he kind of got a, 
a bit of a history lesson and learn his, and he kind of figured out on the fly his connection or the Arabic connection to all this and wove that into his, into the theology of Islam. Um, because he was kind of ignorant of that before that. Mm -hmm. Before encountering the friendly Jews. Who was, I heard somebody. I was curious what that meant on your previous slide where it says the uncaused cause. What did that mean? Um, <laughs> nobody caused God to come into existence. He was not created. He's the uncreated, I guess I would say he's the uncreated being. He's always been in existence. Uh, is that hmm. of any benefit to you, Arlene? Not really. <laughs> I okay. understand the principle, but I just don't understand what they mean by uncaused cause. <laughs> I, I think it's that he causes all things, but he nothing caused him. No one created him. Okay, created that makes that makes a little sense. Some, some Muslims believe that uh, God sustains every second of the day. Uh, through all time, the existence of everything that it requires him to continually sustain it. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that would fit in Christian belief, but that uh, that was not everyone believed that, but that was one belief of, among one of the sects of Muslims. But um, some. Well, that would fit Let's with uh, that would fit with what many people believe. I think of you know everything that happens is kind of preordained. Yeah, they have uh, just like Christianity. They they struggle with uh, free will and predestination. God being all powerful, all knowing, um, and yet we have in Muslim belief, uh, people are responsible. Uh, for their fate, although they disagree with that too, somewhat. Um, okay, I want to see. I guess I covered this slide, so I'll move on. Um, they believe that God has sent messengers to every people on the earth, but that Muhammad was the final messenger and prophet of God sent to restore Islam, which originated with Abraham, which. If that's the case, if Muhammad is the last prophet, what does that make the Quran? Sharon says it was it's the last revelation then. By that, by their thought, uh, he's the last prophet. He's brought forth the last message then. Right. You you could not add to or subtract from the Quran. Okay. And as a recipient, the one who received the revelations in the Quran, they believe Muhammad is the one who best understands the meaning of the Quran. Um, so he's the prime interpreter of the Quran, and he had these uh, other these hadiths that uh, somehow they expound on the Quran and some of the practices of it, and they rank Muhammad above all other prophets, previous prophets for his uh, moral excellence and the message he brought. So they venerate Muhammad, but they don't worship him. They don't consider him divine. He's a model of conduct for Muslims. Um, one of their strong points, I think, is they have a belief that all religious people have a duty to work for a just and equal society. And I think this leads to their being more involved, perhaps, than other religions in politics. Um, they have a political, uh, they believe, uh, yeah, being politically involved. Uh, the the Mutazilis Muslims believe that 
each Muslim is responsible for God, before God, for his own fate. But the traditionalist Muslims said, well, that kind of has the tendency of weakening the omnipotence of God, insulting God's omnipotence. So there's disagreement on the, uh, this predestination free will of how that works, but I don't think anybody's ever got that all worked out in any religion. So uh, there's always one side or another that argues against that. Uh, Sharia law, we've heard that um, here in the United States and overseas both about uh, what Sharia law is, but originally it was an attempt by traditionists to confront the corrupt Callus, who followed the four rightly um, guided Callus, and they wanted to return to the ideals of Muhammad. What do you think of, of Sharia law today? Uh, or do we even really know what it is? We just hear the extremist side of it, of for example, the Taliban or? Well, as a woman, you know, you hear how, um, how strict it is for, and how uh, severe punishments a woman has if they believe that they've had uh, adul ad adultery or, um, done something against the rule of their husbands. And, you know, I don't know how much more there is, but it seems like Sharia law that we hear about is the real severe punishments that are meted out for both men and women if they do things against the basic teachings. Right, that's, I think that's kind of a common view of it. I think it's, it originally wasn't intended that way. In fact, if, if they had tried to get back to the ideals of Muhammad, uh, this was in the traditionist time, which, which is within the first 150 years of Muhammad, the women would have been much more well-treated than what we see today, in, at least in the um, Taliban controlled areas. In other countries, I wonder what Sharia law is. I don't really know. I, I should have researched that. So we'll move on to, uh, there's also, just like Christianity and Judaism, there, there people have, there's different groups within in that religion that have uh, disagreements over what uh, to think about God and what they can talk about. Some of them, the um, Mutazilis, they believe that you could use reason and logic to discuss God. Others, the Hannibalites, they said, no way, you can't talk about God rationally. Uh, that's not a good, you can't use reason because God is beyond understanding. You just can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense to them. So they, then there was others in between who tried to get a compromise, the Asherites, um, but they took an interesting viewpoint that you can show by reason and logic that God is beyond understanding that, and they believe that paradox would enhance our appreciation of God. I'm not sure how, do you have any ideas how that paradox enhances our appreciation? What would that, what would that mean to you? Or what, what would you think? What well, they're, they're, are they referring to? There are, oh, is that what they're referring to about paradox? Well, just some of the beliefs, you know, how can God be this way? And yet we also believe in, for example, back to the predestination, how God can be all knowing. And yet we have our will. There's things that we just, uh, seem contradictory about God that we're, um, if we try to get too much involved with understanding sometimes, maybe we just need to be more uh, accepting of the mystery of God. I, I Maybe that's what he's saying. Jonathan, did you have something? I think, 
I think this has something to do with um, the message of the Book of Mormon, where it talks about uh, there has to be an opposition in all things, and you can't appreciate good until you've experienced evil, and you can't appreciate one thing until you've experienced its opposite. And maybe um, what the compromise is, uh, you have to understand you know, reason and logic to be able to understand the uh, immutable uh, under, uh, belief in God that, that God is beyond understanding. So it's it to me that's the same kind of logic that the Book of Mormon uses. Yeah, that was a good connection. I like that. Thanks. It's also the awesomeness of God. Okay, I heard multiple voices. Marilyn, did you say something? Hope it is Marilyn. Marilyn, unmute yourself. Okay. Marilyn, are you talking? No, you I, I didn't say anything. Sorry. I, I had several screens open. Okay. Uh, well, um, Jane had something to say. I have a comment, but I, if Jane had something, I want to let her oh, go through. I was thinking when you asked this, how would that paradox work? It's, it's that paradox between wanting a personal God, a personal relationship with God that we can understand versus this God that's unknowable. And we have to kind of sit with that, you know, those two things don't really go together, you know? So that's okay. the paradox that I see in God. Okay. The impersonal God and the personal God in how do they coexist together? Right. We, we can't really understand how they coexist, but they do. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll also, my... the, the author also talks about uh, in the Quran, God has 99 names or attributes. And I think part of the, the paradox, of course, is that he's God is re he or she is referred to as uh, uh, dominating and breaking the backs of the enemies and at the same time uh, being forbearing on one hand, uh, he who takes away and he who gives abundantly and he who, who brings those low and he who exalts. Well, uh, you know, you look at the Old Testament, we have the same dilemma, the Old and New Testament. And I think the whole point is God is so complex that only when we understand that there are co conflicts that we as humans don't understand, that the paradox of God is what uh, causes us to appreciate uh, the existence of this supreme being that we just can't divine, define. We can't put him in a, uh, a pigeonhole. In fact, we can't even say whether it's a he or a she or an it. Okay. It's kind of like, it reminds me of the story of the seven blind men and the elephant, and they all uh, felt a different part of the elephant. And, you know, one blind man says it's like a spear because he had a hold of the tusk. And one said, oh, the elephant's like a snake because he had the trunk and Another one said the elephant's like a wall because he was touching the, the side of the elephant and so on. And, you know, as we have kind of gone through this book, we've seen how historically God has been both knowable and unknowable. God has been both, both intimate and distant. Um, so God is kind of all of these things. I think the people who take this compromised position are saying, uh, you know, let's, let's just be respectful of all the beliefs and, and kind of take that as part of the whole maybe i think you all had some good points there so um thank you hey dennis can i take my a... question for you oh go ahead are you guys i i wanted to kind of take a make a comment about sharia law i've been trying to understand how it developed and i read something that said that Think of Sharia law like um, common law in our country. And so you guys know that there's statutes, but little legal lesson here, there's also what we call common law. It's case law, which has developed over the centuries. And that's why we have the Supreme Court, because it changes, you know, year to year. So I'm thinking as I'm looking at the progression of Sharia law and so Muslims interpretation of Sharia law, it's really more about that legal concept in my mind of, of uh, it, it, it develops. So that's why the traditionalists 
set it up kind of differently than what we see it as today. Okay. I'm going to move on to my last slide. And um, this is about the Quran. They believe the Muslims believe the Quran existed in the mind of God from the very beginning. And uh, that God has other holy books. For example, the Torah, there's something I don't know about the scrolls of Abraham David, Psalms, the Gospel of Jesus, all these were divinely revealed in their original form, but have since been come uh, corrupted and aren't fully reliable now. And this is kind of familiar with our own church beginning about the Book of Mormon versus the Bible and the translations of the Bible, what Joseph Smith had to say. So I think that was kind of interesting. Um, so they believe the Quran remains in its original form as divinely revealed to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, which introduces a concept to me of what if you translate the Quran into another language, so then you've changed it from its original form because they it was in Arabic. So I wonder, does that mean it got corrupted if you would believe it, if you think that way? I don't know. That's I'll leave that with you. It's more than well past 10, 15. So I'm going to stop, share. If you've got something to say, um, I guess we're getting ready for the next service. So thanks for all the participation today. I thought we did pretty Dennis, well. Dennis, I would like to just share one little anecdote since my son-in-law was uh, uh, of the Muslim faith, Islam. Um, he always hated Ramadan in the summer. And, and now Ramadan, because it, it's based on the 12 lunar months, so you lose time every every year. And when I first met him, it was in uh, December. <laughs> so it it uh, now it's going to be from April second to May second, and that's getting a little better. But he, in the, the dead of the summer was just his hardest time, especially close to the um, you know to the beginning of summer, the longest days. And he was a real grouch the first few days of Ramadan. <laughs> and he did try to um, adhere to it. No, not even drinking water during the day. And, and that's, that's amazing to me, that type of uh, devotion to a faith. But anyway, for what it's worth. <laughs> Think about not drinking in Arabia on... <laughs> Right, right. Okay. okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Dennis. Sharing. Good lesson. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis.